Well, I'll, I'll remind us of these things, and then hopefully it'll show up there in, uh, in the near future. Um, first of all, Matthew's purpose was to prove that Jesus was the promised Messiah of the Jews. Uh, all of creation, we learned, is completed, and God's work is consummated in the Messiah. And uh, thirdly, Jesus was likely the adopted, not the biological heir of David's throne. So that was another key point that we made. Jesus was likely adopted. And we'll actually get into that a little more today and then maybe a little more next week as we actually look at Joseph's relationship with Mary. Uh, and so we'll jump into the second part of the genealogy here. Uh, Matthew chapter 1 verse... Look at that. It still hasn't changed. So I wonder what's going on. No telling. Uh, but I'm not going to mess maybe with that right now. Maybe I need to update my equipment. Yes. 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 All right. Uh, so um, we'll jump into the second part of the genealogy. Remember, the genealogy uh, is broken up into three sections. Uh, section one we called the inception uh, genealogy. Section two we'll call the kings. And section three will be the section of the exile. Uh, section two goes from Matthew chapter one verse 6b to verse 11. And so let me have somebody read Matthew chapter 1, verses 6b through 11. David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam and Rehoboam the father of Abishah, Abishah the father of Asaph, Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, Joram the father of Uzziah, Uzziah the father of Jotham, Jotham the father of Ahaz, Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. Can you say that fast? Huh? Say that like ten times really fast. Sometimes biblical names are not so easy. So there's a reason people often skip the genealogies, but there's so much, uh, so much fruit here in these uh, genealogies. Uh, since David's throne would be established forever, it was promised to David, his throne would be established forever. Uh, we actually read that, if you remember, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 16, and we saw that passage the last two weeks in a row, and here we see it referenced Again, uh, David's throne would be established forever. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 16. Uh, the, look, it's starting to catch up. The Messiah would sit on the throne established by David's biological descendants. Uh, and so David had a son, Solomon, who had a son, who had a son, who had a son, who had a son. And they were kings. Uh, they were all in this kingly line. Now, David does not mention all of the kings. Uh, do we remember why David skips some of the kings? Uh, Matthew. Yeah, so Matthew, I almost said David again. <laughs> Matthew's point is not to uh, produce an exact chronological account, right? His purpose is to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. And so the order in which Matthew writes the things down... <laughs> Uh, the details that Matthew includes, it all goes to this purpose, and that is to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. Not everything is going to be in exact order. Not every detail is in there. Matthew's gospel would be m much longer if he tried to include every detail of Christ's life. Um, the promise of God to David, not Matthew, David, the promise of God uh, to David uh, is explicitly established in Solomon. We see that in 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 11 and 12, where Solomon has done this heinous thing against God. He has sinned against the God of the universe. And so God, through a prophet, says to Solomon, Solomon, you have sinned. Therefore, I will pull the kingdom away from you. It's prophesied there in Scripture. I will pull the kingdom away from you, but I will not do this. I will not remove your house from this throne, from David's throne, from your father's throne, until after you have passed away, until after you are deceased. Your descendants will be the ones to suffer for your sin because, and God says this explicitly, because of the promise I made to your father, David. 
And so David's throne then is going to be established through Solomon and then through the descendants of Solomon until this, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of David, the throne of David is removed, is taken away from the house of David. And so we read through uh, Samuel and Kings, uh, we read selective passages in there, and uh, we saw over time the kingdom is slowly pulled away from David's house. We saw first the kingdom divide to Israel and Judah, and um, one of David's descendants remained king over Judah. And then when Jehoiachin, or according to Matthew, his name is there in verse um, 11, uh, Jeconiah, uh, he, is, he is the last of David's household who serves as king. Now Zedekiah is related to David, but he was placed in the position of king over Judah by the king of Babylon. And Jeconiah was taken into exile into Babylon. And Zedekiah is the last descendant of David who actually sits on the throne there in Judah. The kingdom is torn away from David's house, but the throne is established. And we looked at that uh, explicitly um, when we looked, it was either last week or the, or the week before that. Um, the biological kings are listed in this genealogy ended, ending with Jeconiah. So Matthew goes, look, the throne of David will be established through David's biological descendants, his actual children. And so in the genealogy, he's listing the kings who are biological descendants, sons of David. And he ends that with, with Jeconiah. The Messiah would come through the established kingly line according to God's Word. And so it had to be the case that through the line of descendants actually, who actually served as kings, through this line of descendants from David, the Messiah's kingship would be established. The Messiah's kingship would be established. I want to, that was a summary of all of the kings. Um, I want to dedicate quite a bit of time tonight See you later, son. I love you. I love you. I love you. Jeconiah and the exile. So we have already been through that. It is trying. It's trying to catch up to us. Uh, we are actually on the next slide now. Uh, Jeconiah and the exile. So we summarized the kings in this section of the genealogy. Um, I really want to look at Jeconiah. Um, the big point that Matthew was making, and this is going to take the rest of our time uh, this evening, um, I encourage you to, in your personal study of Matthew's gospel, uh, to go back and look at all of the names. Um, if your Bible has a concordance or a cross-reference section toward the margin of the Bible, um, look at where those people can be found in Scripture and go and read their stories. Um, or you can just go back and read First and Second Samuel, the First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, and the prophet Jeremiah. All right, uh, you go back and read those things. Uh, there's some of that in the prophet Isaiah too. You know what? Let's just dedicate ourselves in our time to read all of Scripture. I think I think that's a good goal. Uh, so we'll do that. Uh, Jeconiah. Uh, was also known, this is uh, in verse 11 here, the last king mentioned before the exile, before the deportation into Babylon. Jeconiah was also known as Jehoiachin. Uh, we can cross-reference uh, 2 Kings 25, 15, where the last king is named Jehoiachin with Chronicles chapter 3, verse 17, uh, where um, this king is named um, Jeconiah. And... Uh, the reason we know that this is the same guy is because in uh, 2 Kings 25, 15, it is being described that Jehoiachin was being taken into exile by the king of Babylon, the last king who was taken into exile. In 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 17, they call this king the prisoner, the one who went into exile in Babylon, the last king. So it's talking about the same guy, two different names. Now this king has a third name that he is referred to in the scriptures. And we find this in Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 24. Uh, he is also known as 
Coniah, which is like the last part of Jeconiah. So, uh, Coniah. So, Jeremiah called him Coniah. Um, and that's in Jeremiah 22, 24. Uh, now, the throne, again, was taken from David's biological house. This is a really important detail to remember. Um, so, uh, next week, when we ask, what did we talk about last week? Let's remind ourselves, let's review a little bit. Uh, one of the details I really want us to remember is that the kingdom, after Jeconiah was taken from David's biological house, and you can read that in 2 Kings chapter 25. Um, I want to read for a moment Jeremiah chapter 22, verses 24 through 30. And this will be where we are at in the Old Testament text, the prophecy that applies here to the section of Matthew's genealogy. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 22 Verses 24 through 30. And if someone will please read that for us. As I live, declares the Lord, even though Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were a signet ring on my right hand, yet I would pull you off. And I will give you over into the hand of those who are seeking your life. Yes, into the hand of those whom you dread even into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of the Chaldeans. I will hurl you and your mother, who bore you, into another country where you were not born, and there you will die. How far are we going? 30. 30. 30. But, but as for the land to which they desire to return, they will not return to it. Is this man, Kaniah, a despised, shattered jar? Or is he an undesirable vessel? Why have he and his descendants been hurled out and cast into a land that they had not known? O land, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, write this man down, childless, a man who will not prosper in his days, for no man of his descendants will prosper, sitting on the throne of David, will prosper sitting on the throne of David, or ruling again in Judah. Jeremiah talking about Jehoiachim, slash Jeconiah, slash Kaniah. What is Jeremiah prophesying to the king here? To the people? Yeah, he's done. He's, he will no longer be king. He will be taken into Babylon. Um, the wrath of of God will be against him and his household. And the most important part of of that is this, Jeremiah says about the king, Coniah, Jeconiah, Jehoiachin, says about him, one of his descendants, it's biological, will never again sit on the throne. Will never again sit on the throne. Uh, that's the big idea from that passage of scripture. Um, here in Jeremiah, this prophecy. And so we have then this case where in the Old Testament, um, God has promised David that his throne will be forever. It'll be an everlasting throne. And one of his descendants will always sit on the throne, right? We talked last week about how that wasn't necessarily biological, but legal. Here, God, through Jeremiah, telling Jehoiachin, your descendants, your children, people who come from your body, your seed, will never sit on the throne again. Will never sit on the throne again. This is devastating for a people who hope for the Messiah of David and then know that the prophecy of Jeremiah states that people through this kingly line will never sit on the throne again. It is severe hopelessness. It is to be desolate in what we believe. It is to be religious, but lost and knowingly so. The people were in physical exile they were also in spiritual exile 
they were also in spiritual exile. The coming of the Messiah was then impossible by any human work whatsoever. The people were physically and spiritually in exile with no hope. Uh, Jesus, Jesus comes on the scene. We see this genealogy in Matthew chapter 1 verse 18, chapter 1 verse 20, chapter 1 verse 23, and chapter 1 verse 25. We see this truth, and I'm sorry it's not up there so that you could keep up with the verses listed. We see this fact. Jesus was conceived not by Joseph, not by a biological descendant of Jehoiachin, but by the Holy Spirit. Matthew is very careful to point this out. Jesus is conceived by the Holy Spirit. But Jesus was also adopted through the marriage of Mary and Joseph. We see that in chapter 1, verse 16, and we see that in chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. Um, And so we ask this question, why is it the case that Jesus was born of a virgin? And we'll open up the floor here. Why is it the case that Jesus was born of a virgin? Uh, let's jump back in here. It looks like we're caught up. Oh, cool. Um, so Jesus uh, adopted through marriage. Why was Jesus born of a virgin? Um, first of all, the scriptures say nothing about it being because of original sin. Um, I have heard that several times. I can't find any basis for that in scripture. And I think what happens is people started philosophizing, which sometimes is good. And speculation leads us to think, okay, original sin is passed down genetically. And so we get in our minds that there's something like genetics and it's passed from the father to... We get our genetics from our moms too. So I'm not sure how well that argument's going to hold up to scrutiny if it's really scrutinized. What we do get in the scriptures is this. The reason Jesus had to be born the way that he was born was simply for the, and we'll find that most of the things in the Bible happen the way that they do for this reason and this reason alone. Because God said it would happen that way. Because Jesus had to fulfill the word of the Lord and the prophecies. And look, the only way you get a descendant of David legally that's not by biology through the kingly line is by that heir being born outside of the line of David and then being adopted into the line of David. It's like, guys, do you know of any other possible way? Could this happen by chance? What so, this is so unlikely if things happen by chance that this, this thing in particular would never happen. It's almost like God is working this out on purpose, according to his will, and according to his plan that was already in place. It's kind of amazing, kind of amazing to think about. This thing is done on purpose. And the reason we have the prophecies of the Old Testament is so that we can look at Christ in light of the prophecies in the Old Testament and say, this is the only guy that fits the bill. And these prophecies are so unlikely to be fulfilled by any one person that This has to be Jesus. There's not another Messiah coming. The Messiah has already come. The Old Testament is a testimony to Jesus. That's the point of everything God did in the Old Testament times. It's all a testimony to the person and the work of Jesus Christ. His incarnation and His crucifixion and His resurrection and His ascension to His heavenly throne. That's the point. That's the point. Do we see the importance of adoption in the scriptures? We ask this question to why do you think it's important that Jesus might have been adopted? Now we know that it almost has to be the case that Jesus was adopted. It's how the Old Testament says things would come about. Adoption is a huge theme in the scriptures. Why? Why is that? Because Christ Through Christ, God the Father adopts us as his children. Despite all of our sin, despite our insufficiencies, despite all of that, we are adopted children, brought out of our unrighteousness, out of the darkness, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We are made light. And God is the one doing all that work. Doing all that work. 
brothers and sisters, adoption is important. And that applies in our lives today, right? In our culture in particular. How many, how many children do we have that are just in the, in the state system that need adopt, adoptive parents? How much is adoption is this beautiful picture of what Christ has done for us? And if Christ has adopted us, should we not be a people who are adopting people, not just out of the system, not just from homes where children are in a bad place, but how much more so should we be adopting people in our community for the purpose of the gospel so that they might be adopted by Christ no matter their circumstances, no matter their sin, no matter their insufficiencies? That's evangelism. That's evangelism. That's what we're here to do. That's called loving people because Christ first loved mm -hmm. us. That's exactly what that is. And that wasn't part of the lesson either. All sorts of free stuff today. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. And we'll actually read more than uh, just 17 there. So let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 10. And the Lord said to me, Arise, go on your journey at the head of the people, so that they may go in and possess the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all, in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today, for your good, for your good, Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth with all that is in it. Yet the Lord set his heart in love on your father and chose their offspring after them, you above all peoples as you are this day. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your feet. <laughs> Heart. Heart. Okay. <laughs> and being no longer stubborn. And what paint would turn. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. So Matthew, up to this point in his genealogy, in the section of the kings now, has described Jesus as the king in the line of kings. Does this sound like a title we have for Jesus? Like king of kings. Matthew is establishing Jesus as the king of kings, though Matthew doesn't explicitly use that title. That, and I think he doesn't use that title because he's writing to Jews and it would be an immediate turnoff. That title was a title that belonged exclusively to God exclusively to the God of the universe. And you see it there in verse 17, Deuteronomy chapter 10. The Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, or the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In the New Testament, um, authors refer to Jesus by calling Jesus the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You can see that 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15. So the Apostle Paul referred to Jesus as King of kings, Lord of lords. Revelation chapter 17, verse 14, and Revelation chapter 19, verse 16. So John, the disciple of Jesus, the apostle, the elder of the churches, referred to Jesus as King of kings and Lord of lords. Here Matthew is establishing Jesus as the King of kings and Lord of lords, which means that Matthew is implicitly declaring Jesus has the same title as God. Jesus has the same title as God. And there's no other way this thing works out. He was born of a virgin. He fulfills all of the prophecies, the genealogical prophecies, the prophecies regarding his kingly lineage. He fulfills that. He, all of creation is completed in him. These are details that Matthew has confirmed up to this point in his genealogy. We're only to verse 11, right? And Matthew has done so much work for the Jewish people to declare to the Jews, profess to the Jews, Jesus is our Messiah. Up to this point, man, the Jews, it, they, should be, they should buy this, right? The chances of even up to this point, 
all of this being the way that it was, is so slim that it had to be done on purpose, worked out by the God of the universe, the only one who has authority over biology and over the events of nature and over the events of humankind, the only one who has um, authority to put a baby in a mother's womb with, without that woman doing the, the deed, the only one who can do that stuff has to be worked out by him. The Jews should buy this. But Matthew has 27 more chapters after this one, and we're not even through chapter 1. In my opinion, it would have been okay for Matthew to stop right here and make his point. But he doesn't, and he doesn't for a purpose. And the rest of the gospel is inspired too, and I just can't wait to get there. I can't wait. I cannot wait to get there. Uh, New Testament authors use this title as a designation for Jesus. Uh, Matthew concludes his gospel in chapter 28, 27 chapters from here, by saying what? All, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. Matthew is making a very particular point regarding the kingly authority of Jesus. Jesus is the one who sits on the throne of David that was established through David's descendants. And no one else, no one else can do that. Um, even if we think about like future, the further you get in time, the more unlikely it becomes that someone could actually do that, right? Um, Jesus is the only one who fits the bill. The only one who fits the bill. Uh, this gospel, we're going to move into a time of application, and I look forward to some good discussion tonight. The gospel, did you know, is entirely political. Excuse me? It's entirely political. <laughs> now be careful what we say, guys, because this application might, might get us. Right? Uh, we are going to talk about politics, but politics for the Christian is vastly different than the politics of the world. Amen. Amen. Politics of the Christian, the Christ follower, is this. Jesus is king. Period. Yes. Sorry, I have chills. And doesn't it say the government will be on his shoulders? Period. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Jesus well, is king. Period. So for the, for the Christian, something like politics is approached differently than it is by the people of the, of the world. Um, does this truth, Jesus is king, and I, I want to have this conversation with you, does this truth, Jesus is king, bid us to approach human politics in a certain way, and how? <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Paul writing to his student Timothy, you, therefore, so there's a context here. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to these, uh, to faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And listen to this. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember, Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel. That's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. And so Timothy, uh, Paul, writing to Timothy, appeals to Jesus Christ's kingship as a descendant of David, sitting on the throne of David, he appeals to that kingship, that authority of Jesus Christ, Christ being king. And he says, Timothy, all the things, things are going on in the context of 2 Timothy. Timothy is experiencing what we call today ministerial depression. He is preaching 
and he is trying to lead a church, and everybody's doing their own thing. He still sees idol worship, and people are complaining, and people are trying to have things their way. People are fighting, and people are bickering. And Paul writes to Timothy, and he says, Timothy, suffer hardship with me. Interesting, right? Timothy, suffer hardship with me. Remember the grace of Jesus Christ. Teach faithful men also to instruct others regarding the grace of of Jesus Christ. And Timothy, stay on task. Stay on task and don't get distracted. Be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. A good soldier doesn't what? Concern himself with the affairs of the civilians. A good soldier strives to serve the one who enlisted him, Jesus Christ. Be a good soldier. Compete as an athlete who wants to win this race according to the rules. Preach grace. There I think we find the best advice when approaching politics and government, politics and church, denominational politics. People of the world are doing crazy things. We are to stay on task. Stay on task. Remember the grace of Jesus Christ. Seek to please King Jesus in all that you do. Paul's advice to Timothy wasn't go and argue with everybody about what is morally right. (laughs) Paul's advice to Timothy was not go and complain about everybody that you think is trying to do something but is ignorant in doing so. No. Paul's advice to Timothy was this. Timothy, Be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Stay on task. And so when we engage the politics of the world, brothers and sisters, we have have great opportunity when we engage the politics of the world. And it's not to jump on the same train and get into partisan arguments with other people, whether in church or on a governmental level. That's, That's not the agenda of the Christian, right? The agenda of the Christian is this. As I engage the politics of this world and its wretched estate, my job, my one and only job is to speak the grace of Jesus Christ into that, to be light in the darkness, to be a city on a hill, to be the salt of the earth. That is my job. That is my one job. And it is, it is my opinion that in the world today, we who call ourselves Christians do a pretty good job of mucking that up and getting involved in civilian affairs. We are to be on task, brothers and sisters, remembering the grace of Christ, speaking life. Speaking life. And we do that in the way that we vote. We speak life. We do that as we talk with people who have political opinions that differ from ours. Our our goal is not to win an argument, right? Right? Our goal is what? Speak life. Stay on task. You are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Live like it. That is the advice that we get in the scriptures. And that's often convicting to me because, man, I like to get involved in arguments. 